but I'm so glad that you're here. So we're going to talk about fatherhood. Here are three scriptures that uh, we, we talk about typically when it comes to Father's Day as we begin to answer the question, what is the impact of a father on his children? Let's think about that for a minute. What's the impact of a father on his children? Or the impact of a father on our community? I mean, when fathers are absent, what, what hole does that leave in our community? And what is the blessing of a father on his children, good, bad, and ugly? Now, this past week, and I'll share some things that uh, my family shared with me. Uh, I'm, listen, when it comes to children, I hit the jackpot, okay? I, you just need to know, I won the lottery when it comes to children being born in your house. I got my daughter sitting right over here, Jennifer. My son is in South Carolina, but I got two of the greatest kids in the world. They're not perfect. Their dad's not perfect. Most of the, of the biggest disappointments, heartbreaks, challenges in our family, I caused. You just need to know. But they are great forgivers. And I've got great relationships with both my kids and my grandkids. And I am so lucky. I'm blessed, you know, by God. But the impact that a father can have on his children is huge. And so I asked them this week, hey, what did I do right? You know, when you were at home, what did we do? I mean, what did I do as a father that it allows me to be so blessed today to have such good relationships with you. And what did I mess up, you know, so that I can just kind of give this word of encouragement to dads and challenge, you know, to dads. And so they shared with me some stuff. And, and, and on a community, we're going to talk about that because there's this amazing verse in the Bible where it's a still unfulfilled prophecy that God has over our nation and over our world if we'll just heed to it. So, here are three typical scriptures. This one's out of 1 Thessalonians. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. And we do those, right? Fathers, we're always pleading. I want to plead with you to go in the right direction or to do the right thing or to seek God in everything that you do. I want to plead. There are things that we just would plead. There were encouragement. You know, man, you can learn how to hit a baseball. You can, you're great at soccer. We're just encouraging. You can do it. You can do it. Press through. I know it's difficult now, but, but man, you can do it. You'll make good grades. You'll whatever those things are. And we're always urging, hey, go, go try out. If you don't make it, it's okay. But, you know, we're just, we see the future and we're trying to help lead our kids and point them in a positive direction. You know, we're being honest with them about our lives so that they know we're not perfect, but we're sharing with them what's important to us. Because what's important to us just may become very important to them. Amen? So, okay, here's another verse. Father, to anger by the way you treat them. Just pause. Yeah, just... Be careful in the way you treat your children. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, discipline is very different than punishment. We were even singing, uh, singing that song, and, and Isaac even read a scripture about punishment, because punishment has to do with fear. Punishment really is about inflicting some kind of pain so that hopefully they'll make a better decision later. But usually, it just becomes about the pain, Discipline's very different. It says, this is where we are. This is where we want to be. And we need to narrow our focus. We need to reduce. We need to get things right along the way. So we're going to keep you in line as we move toward the target, the goal. Right? So that's discipline. And it comes with instruction. Here's the third one. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they'll become discouraged. Whew, right? It's like, oh, man, dads. Come on, sometimes we aggravate them because we just, we don't spend time with them. You know, we, we don't, we, they're not important enough to us to get us away from the television or to get us away from whatever, work or whatever it is that we're doing. Sometimes it's apathy. But fathers, man, we got to be careful. Rob our children of joy. Listen, that might be me. I may be stepping in a dead zone. So, Sean, whatever you need to do to point me so that I don't keep going out. Thank you. Okay, so here's our first point for our message today. Fathers have the power to change a nation. Here's the amazing verse of Scripture that I wanted to share with you. This is an unfulfilled prophecy. Now, this is the last two verses in the last chapter in the last book of your Old Testament. 
So 66 books in the Bible, 39 old, 27 new, a gap of 400 years between the two testaments. And you would expect there's going to be something that the writer would say at the end of the Old Testament to bridge the gap into the New Testament. And Malachi does that with this verse. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now, Jesus talked about this in Matthew. And he's like, hey, the fulfillment of that prophecy was John the Baptist. He came in the spirit of Elijah. And he proclaimed the way of the Lord, Jesus, our Messiah, right? And then he said, listen, he's going to proclaim the way. And he's about to tell you, and he's going to instruct you in something. This is the unfulfilled prophecy part. He's going to, and of all the things he could have shared about Elijah, and there's a bunch of them. This is what he chose to say to us who are now living in New Testament latter days. Here it is. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now, I want you to pause on that for a minute. There's something about what, what John the Baptist brought and what was fulfilled in Jesus that something new is going to happen in our world. Dads, if we can get the dads to take seriously their role as a father and turn their hearts wholeheartedly to their children, and if we can get the children to turn their hearts wholeheartedly to the father, your nation will go in such a positive direction it will honor God, and God's going to do some special blessing there that it would not happen if... If the fathers don't, because if the fathers don't and the children don't, we're going to see something in our world so bad it's going to feel like everything is cursed. Now, this is rhetorical. Don't answer out loud. Which do you believe we are living in right now in our nation? As a nation, are we closer to this or are we closer to this? So what he's saying is, the power to transform your community, your state, your nation into the awesome blessing of God is if we as dads will take our role seriously and help our children to turn their hearts. So I'm going to show you where we are right now in our community. And why we decided as a church, we have to get involved in this ministry. You know that we now are involved in the foster care ministry. We're in the uh, bio family ministry. We're helping bio families get their children back. And some have not lost their children, but, they're, but they had an event that, you know, so it's like they're, they, they've been flagged. And so, okay, we got to make sure that we're moving in a positive direction. So... The DCF case process looks like this. The children, Department of Children and Family Services... They, these hotline calls. And so they'll get a phone call that says, hey, uh, there are bruises on a child from school. Or the police, we went on a domestic dispute call. Or uh, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Or a, so, uh, usually a child will call and, and about something that's happening to them. And they get a certain number of phone calls every day. In our community. And this survey is based on the Circuit 1 area, which is four counties, Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton County, 3,800 square miles. And so it, we call it the Circuit 1 area. So they get daily hotline calls. Then they go and investigate a number, a certain number of those calls. Either they rise up to the level where it needs to be an investigation uh, or some of the calls are ongoing cases where it's just another call, but they're already involved with the family. Different reasons why certain numbers are investigated. Then out of those, if it rises to the level, they'll take on that case. And they'll either go into a safety plan or they'll go into a judicial plan. One is where they volunteer to go through all of uh, the accountability. The other, they have to go before a judge, and a judge holds them accountable to certain behavior. And out of those come wins. A win is if children are never removed from the home or if those parents get their children back. Okay, now, what do you think the numbers are? How many phone hot, daily hotline calls do you think we get in the Circuit 1 area? A hundred. 
800. Actually, it's more than 1,000. It's closer to 1,200. I'm trying to be conservative. And it goes up and down. In the summer, we get more calls because children aren't home. And during the school year, it goes down a little bit. Around Christmas, it just shoots right back up. And so, can you believe that? Up to 1,200 phone calls every day of people reporting some type of abuse. But this is the troubling part. We only investigate 10%. And if I told you some of the stories, it would just, it would probably make you mad. You know, because children are going through abuse and they'll make a phone call. And, and what we're actually saying to the children when we decide not to investigate is, one, we don't believe you. Or two, well, it's not that bad. And, and just so that you'll know, the level of what it takes to remove a child from a home now is Uh, pretty severe, a lot of trauma takes place before they'll remove a child just because we're limited in the number of beds. We have more children in this area who are going into either foster care or adoption or being removed from homes than almost any other place in the state of Florida. We have as many here as they have in Miami. And look at the size of our community and the size of the Miami community. It's just, okay, so, and then they only take 25 cases, 25% of those become cases, and then out of those, and so annually, it doesn't take much to look at. Can you believe 365,000 calls every year of children saying, my dad is, please help me. 36,000 become investigated. 9,125 actual cases every year in our area. And our success rate is embarrassingly low. So we decided to get involved. You see on the side where I put FC Outreach? That's where our church gets involved. We get involved right here when there's an investigation. If they say, yep, so there's been something to happen. However, we believe in these parents. We believe that they can get it right. They'll come to our parenting classes or they'll get involved with our SMS, our safety management services, and we can help these families move in a positive direction. And I'm telling you, I've met some great families you know, in this, and people who really, really want to work and do it right. I'm really proud of them, really, really proud of them, okay? So, but this is, this is, man, listen, we, we have the power to change our community, and God promised it. If we'll take this seriously, and really, because this is a mountain, I mean, this is a mountain that needs to be moved, amen? And Jesus said, if you'll just have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be moved and it will happen. Amen? I'm gonna stand up here. I'm just telling you, I'm just declaring it right now. We've already done this once. When we first got into the foster care world business, we told you it was a crisis. They were sending 200 of our children down south because we had no place for them. And and parents were losing control of their children. And that was a crisis. And we said within five years, we're gonna be able to stand up and tell you that has changed. And we've already done that. We got involved, amen, thank you. And so we, we didn't do it on our own, right? Not just First City Church. There's a bunch of, there's a community, but we prayed about it, we poured into it. Now we've already come, you know, overcome. This is their next mountain. And you, you watch, within four years or so, we're gonna see this being transformed in the name of Jesus. And believe it or not, the state is paying us to do that. They're paying us to go into these homes two to three times every week and take to them the good news of Jesus Christ. And they said, because you've got a good reputation through your family's count program, they said, would you please invite them to your church? Because your church is full of grace and you've got great people. That's on you. Good for you. Thank you. Okay, so how do we accomplish it? The first thing is God commands fathers to teach their children his story. It's a commandment. God says, fathers, teach them. In fact, here you go. My children, this is Solomon in uh, the book of Proverbs. Attention and learn good judgment, for I'm giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instruction. For I too was once my father's son, tenderly loved um, as my mother's only child. That's Solomon talking. My father taught me. Take my words to heart. Follow my commands and you will live. My father taught me, pause, how many of your fathers taught you the way of God? Maybe it's rhetorical. I can raise my hand high because my father did. 
the, one of the biggest blessings of my life, right? And my grandfather taught me the way also. So how many, but how many of our fathers taught us the way of God? That's the first thing we got to do. If I'm a father and I'm sitting in the audience, I'm writing that down. It's my responsibility to teach the way of God to my children. It's good when you take them to a Christian school and they're learning it there. Or when you take them back to our classes and they come out and you're like, what did you learn in Sunday school today? That's great. But God expects us dads to teach his story to our children. Right? So, so that's number one. And uh, well, that was the second point, but here's our third point. We need to create shared life experiences and teach from them. I want to create is I want to do this journey with my children. And we're going to create ways that together we'll discover God. Now for me, and my, and my daughter sitting over here, so she'll hold me accountable to it and you can ask her. And by the way, she will absolutely tell you the truth. All right, so she's, she got that from her mama. And so, did your dad get it right? She'll say, unfortunately, some of the biggest pain of my life comes from my dad. And, it's, and she's right. She'll also say, the most loved I've ever been is from my dad. Hopefully, maybe from her mama. She's really close to her mama, who's sitting next to her, right? But I hope that I'm one of her greatest blessings. I hate that I'm, I've been one of her biggest disappointments, right? I'm not perfect. <laughs> Boy, am I not perfect. But man, God is good. Even dads, even if you've blown it, God can restore your heart and your children's heart. And so I want to share a little bit of this with you. How do you create shared life experiences? So I just made a list of some things. Here's the verse of scripture, Psalm 78. He established a testimony. God established a testimony in Jacob and appointed his law in Israel. I love that word testimony. Jacob, man, when he was young, he was a liar. He was a deceiver. He only cared about himself. He was trading bowls of soup for his brother's blessing. That was just crazy. Uh, the birthright. And yet in the end of his life, all he wanted to do is serve the Lord. And he wanted his sons to serve the Lord. He wanted to die with the people of the Lord. He wanted his name to be a faithful name in God's mouth. And so God transformed this deceiver, this liar, and turned him into a godly man. Whew, anybody but me can relate. So, it's, and it's a testimony. You walk that. You walk, you walk with that. My daughters asked me questions that were embarrassing. And I wanted to lie to her. I didn't want to say, yes, I did that. Right? But you don't, we don't, we, right? We don't ever lie about these things. Because God can transform through the truth if we'll let him. Okay. And so, which he commanded our fathers, here it is again, to teach their children to the next generation so they will know him, even the children yet unborn. And they'll rise and tell to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments that they should not be like their fathers. Apparently, fathers can be stubborn and rebellious. But we want to be steadfast. Sometimes fathers are not. Sometimes we're not faithful to our commitments, to our covenants, to our word, to our God. God can overcome all of that in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, how do we do it? Well, I just listed some things, and I put them in categories of daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly. Now, dads, there's an outline in, that, in the pew in front of you. And so, if you want to, you can just kind of follow along. And I'm secretly hoping that my grandson, who's in the nursery will start crying, wanting his papa, so that by the end of this message, I can hold him while we pray to God. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of claiming that. And so, Jennifer, if I get to the end of our message and they have not come to call on you, not, don't go yet. Then, uh, I, I want you to go get him because I want to end my Father's Day message with AJ. Okay, is that okay with you? You good with that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, daily, 
devotions. I loved having devotion time. So Suzanne would make breakfast. We would sit at the table and we would have these little books and I would read the stories of God. And then because we lived, you know, when we lived at this church property, the school that we went to was like 45 minutes away. We'd get in my little truck and Jennifer and Jonathan and I would ride to school and I got to take them to school most every morning. And during those times, I loved it. Jennifer was the one who said it the most. She would say, tell us a story, daddy. And I'd be like, okay, you're not going to believe this one. Oh, I bet I will. You're not going to believe this one. One time there were these four young men and they were thrown in a fire because they refused to not be loyal to God. Oh, I know this one. I know this one. You do. Tell me that story. And so we would go over. Listen, I wanted my children to hear the stories of God from me. Right, to know the way of God for me. And so we would go over them at home and we would ride down the road. And so I'd say, well, tell me the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Daniel. And so they, statue, they wouldn't bow down to it. They threw them in the fire. They'd tell me the story. Parts they missed, I would get to say, oh, and don't forget this part. That's so important, right? We would just talk about the stories of God in our devotional time, prayer time. It's probably the one thing I'm the most proud of as a father. From the, from the time they were born until they left our home, every night I prayed with our children. There was a time when I had to travel for a while and we would do it over the phone. But every night we would pray. So I'll tell this one on my daughter. When she was a little bitty old thing, she wasn't even a year old. We were living in Jacksonville, Florida at the time. And so we would go in the room and I would hold her on this side. I'd hold her and we would sing our songs. We had a couple of songs that we sing. We'll still sing them today. And, um, and then I would get ready to say our prayer. And so we'd say our prayer. And as soon as I would start, dear God, and I tried to have this cadence Dear God, she just put her head down immediately. And we do our prayer. And at the end, in Jesus' name, amen. Right? She would lift up her head and she would turn her body down into the bed. I'd lay her down in the crib and she would just go right to sleep. She was just great that way. But that was just our routine. And, and so with AJ, her grandson, I'm, we're so lucky that they live here in town. So sometimes on the weekends, they'll come over and they'll stay at our house. And I get to help put AJ down, you know, for his nap or his bedtime at night. And we have a routine. So we'll lay him down on the changing table and they have these sleep sacks. Have y'all seen these sleep sacks? They're, I think I want a sleep sack if they make one for adults. And, and you zip him all the way up and I'll do my hands like this, which lets him know I want to pick him up. So he'll come and I'll hold him and then... Suzanne or Jennifer will get in the little rocking chair. They're way better at rocking him to sleep than I am. But I'll stand in a whole AJ, just like I used to do with Jennifer. And then right above his little crib, there's this scripture. And so I'll go and I'll face it. And I'll raise my hand. And I'll look at him and I'll say, I'll quote that scripture. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God goes with you everywhere you go. He's gotten to the point now that when I'll go and I'll raise my hand, he'll lift his hand with me. He'll, he'll just, he'll lift up his hand and he'll point, right? And then I hug him. I say, I love you. Mm -mm. And he'll go, mm -mm. and then he'll do a dive to his grandma, to his nanny or his mama. And then they'll rock him to sleep. That's our routine. I don't know what my routine is going to be like with him as we get older, but I want to teach him the way of the Lord, right? So prayer time, encouragement and vision. I mean, just encouraging, just you can do it, you can do it. Sharing vision, you know, just creating these special moments for our children, you know, just letting them know, man, I believe in you. I believe in you. Make everything fun. Both of our kids will tell you that uh, one of the things that, that, that they share with me is we loved watching you and mom dance in the kitchen. So Suzanne would be making dinner and I'd say, get over here. We'd play the Beach Boy music and I'd just dance with her. And Jennifer would go, Ugh, stop it. Ugh. She said, I know I did all that, but I really loved it because it made me feel secure. Right? Make everything fun. Have fun. Laugh a little. You know, I bet you can't get out of this one. And I'm holding them in traps. Just, 
Make everything fun. Weekly. Don't let anything interrupt worship. Teach how to love God, how to focus on Him. He's the one who's going to save their soul at the end of their life. Right? Don't let them be in a small group. Don't take it for granted here. Our teenagers are in every Wednesday night. They're in small groups. Get people in a small group so they can just share life. Right? Get everything out. Support their hobbies and sports. My son was laughing. He's like, Dad, you always supported my sport. He's like, hey, guess what, Dad? I want to play football. I'm like, yeah. So I'm buying all this equipment at the end of the year. He's like, I'm never doing that again. I'm like, okay. <laughs> then he's like, hey, I'm going to wrestle. Yeah, I'm buying all this stuff. And there, he tried everything there was once, and then he quit. He never stayed with any of that stuff except hockey. For whatever reason, he loved to ice skate, and he loved hockey, and he was good at it, right? So he's like, but the, you were so faithful. You would sell out to everything, even though I didn't stick with it. My daughter, she just learned how to write, and there were a few things that she did. She sticks with all of the things that she started. But just support them. Dinner time. Make dinner time fun. Make family time fun. Monthly. Holiday traditions. Uh, Easter egg hunting was a big one at our house. We'd hunt eggs and hunt eggs and hunt eggs. And, and Jennifer loved it. We'd have to hunt them four, five, six, twenty 20 times in a day. We were worn out by the end of the day. But she doesn't forget it. Guess who does Easter egg hunting now? And she can't wait. She's like, AJ, hurry up and grow up so we can do Easter egg hunting. So, and we're going to do those. But make them fun. You know, uh, Valentine's Day. I'm talking about my daughter a lot because she's just sitting here in the audience. I started buying her roses from the time I think you were 14. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to cry. I'm such a weakling. When she went to college, when we left, I moved down here in 07, 06, 07. And she went to college. And you know she kept all of those roses. that I'd give her a dozen roses every year. So she'd hang them upside down so they'd dry. I just, I had no idea that it meant so much to her. I still give her roses to this day. Gave her, you know, a dozen this year. So I just, it's just a tradition. It's our family. She's my daughter. She's always going to be my daughter. And I'm never going to stop loving her, right? So family partnered events. So sometimes you'll have family events together. Sometimes dads and sons will go do something. Mothers and daughters will go do something. And, uh, and those are fun. And, and, you know, the, the family partnered events, sometimes it just, it brings out stuff that you had no idea. So my daughter was telling me, she said, you have no idea about this, but you know, you're the one who taught me how to write. She writes poetry and she's amazing at it. And, and, uh, and so I said, what? She goes, yeah. She said, I was, you know, young. I don't know how old she was. Do you remember 13, 14? Anyway, she was young and uh, she was bored. She said, I was really, really bored. And you noticed that I was really bored. And all of a sudden you came over and you had taken one of my beanie babies and hid it at the church. So we lived not too far from the church. And so I took her, I guess her beanie baby and maybe a few other little things. And I said, hey, I took one of your beanie babies. You got to find it. Well, how am I going to find it? Well, I got some clues. So I handed her a clue and it took her on a journey. And so she had to go. And once she figured out the riddle, figured out the clue, the first one said this, go to where, help me, go to where the floor bends and the fun never ends. Is that right? And so we had a trampoline in our yard. And so go to where the floor bends. And the fun never ends. Oh, it's another trampoline. She goes to the trampoline, finds another clue. And she followed all the clues. She found her beanie baby. She had fun. She says, you know, I went in my bedroom and for hours from then on, I tried to learn how to make words rhyme. And I, it meant so much to me. That's where I started learning how to write. Oh, thank you, God. Just service projects. Teach them how to serve the Lord. Child-driven events. What does that mean? Well, we let our children pick out what are we going to do? You know, sometimes it's as simple as when we would go out to eat and there was a line and they would give us one of those, hey, this thing will ring when, you're, when it's your turn. We would give it to our kids. They'd pass it back and forth. They get to hold it for two minutes at a time. And if it went off while they're holding it, they got to choose what our appetizer or dessert would be. Right? Just something simple. Sometimes, who came up with shrimp night? You or Jonathan or both? They came up with shrimp night. Shrimp night. And they're like, yeah. So we'd go buy shrimp. And we'd make shrimp three or four different ways. And we'd have shrimp night. And so it became a Thursday night kind of a thing. Just have fun with your family. And then annually. If you have never researched spiritual or Jewish festivals, 
man, I will encourage you to do that. God created a rhythm of family with fathers and children and festivals. One of them was they would go camping every year for a week. They call it the, temp, the fist festival of booths or of tents. And they would take them camping and the dads would gather them around at night and he'd say, have you heard the story about Moses? One time, God led them through this wilderness until he took them to their own land, and, uh, and so, which was a lot of fun. So they would learn about these stories and make birthdays special. My wife taught me how to do that. Oh, we have fun with birthdays. Rites of passage ceremonies, I don't have enough time to talk about it, but I have some if you would like. Hey, they're turning 13. They're, they're about to get their driver's license. They're about to graduate from high school. They're going through their first, you know, they're going from fifth grade to sixth grade. Rites of passage, make them special. Just drive a stake in the ground so they never forget it. And then vacations, go on some fun ones. Before my daughter walks back in, I told you she's writing poems. She wrote me one yesterday. Dada to Papa. And it's four little lines. And uh, it takes when she was a little child, things we did. When she was a teenager, things she did and asked me to do with her. When she was grown and started working, you know, out of college. And then now that she's a mom, this is what she wrote me. Dada put me in a trap and hold on tight. Say our prayers and tuck me in for the night. Stir my ice cream till it's nice and soft. <laughs> Sunday best, we do it our favorite song. Dada, time is changing, but one thing remains true. There's no other dada like the one I have in you. Dada, need a ride. You see, I met a cute guy. Stop asking so many questions. Dad, it's all right. <laughs> Yes, you can trust me. Now can I please leave? It's not that I don't love you. I just want to do me. Dad, I wasn't always right, but one thing remains true. No other dad would have stuck with me quite like you. Daddy, life is busy now. Where's the time gone? The nights are always short and the working days are long. You give the best advice, even though, it's, even though I'm on my own. That's why every time I have news, it's you, I always phone. Daddy, you're my biggest supporter. That still remains true. But Daddy, there's still room for more support from you. Papa, you're just like Dada and even better to me. I look up to Mama and she looks up to you, you see. So put me in a trap and Papa, hold on tight. Say our prayers. And ask mom if you can tuck me in tonight. Papa, things sure have changed, but one thing remains true. Mama sure does love you, and Papa, I do too. How could I get so lucky? So, did she go back to get him? Oh, it, we're past time. Oh. Hi. Hey, how are you? Hey, hi, Mama. So, look, these are all, all these people. You see them? Hey, everybody. Hi. Say hi. This is my buddy. Say, Jay. Ah, and uh, I have two other grandsons. Oh my goodness, we are so lucky. But. This is very important to me that he learns that there's a God in heaven who loves him way more than I do, who will cry at all the things that make him cry, who will laugh at all the things that make him laugh, but who will love him all the way to heaven. Hey, you want to say our scripture? Yep. I told him that sometimes what I'll do is I'll hold you. And I'll point up like this, and I'll say, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you everywhere you go. I love you. Mm -hmm. 
he knows it's time to reach out for his mama now. So you're looking at her. I'm going to pray with you, and I'm not going to put you down. I want to pray over you. God loves you very much. He sent his son to die so that you would live forever in heaven with him. We celebrate that in communion every week. And so, well, hi. And so, I want us to pray. And then, thank you for being here today. I love you. So, why don't we dim the lights? Tell God thank you for what he's done for you. Stand with me, please. And then, if you want, you can walk up to the front or the back and grab your communion and just have your own quiet time with God. I hope that you've been encouraged. Take your role seriously. Our children and our nation depend on it. Hi, you ready to pray? Dear God, we love you very much. Thank you for loving us. We want to learn how to give you our whole hearts like you have done for us. We love you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Develop in us the heart of a child, the innocence of a child that celebrates all of your blessings. And we can't wait to one day be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.